morning. That's why you just get your keynotes first thing on a Sunday morning, get people out of bed for your festival. I just want to make a few announcements um, before I introduce our, our second announcement speaker for this year's Free Play. Uh, the first one is um, you all just lost the game. Anyone who's played the game, you've all just lost. But you lost first. That's true, that's true, but that's okay. Um, we found a hat. If anyone is missing a sweet hat, uh, we have it. Um, uh, I also want to let you know that two of the workshop sessions have kind of upper limits, uh, people-wise. The, uh, the prototyping session is probably going to max out about 50 people, uh, and the, the writing session is going to max out about 30 people, so if you want to go to either of those, you might get there early to avoid disappointment. Uh, and the last thing is, we, are, we have our first awards tonight, um, which we're very excited about. I've just been signing certificates. Um, we made a schedule, and we're going to need maybe about half an hour to set up. So we're going to kick off the awards at five. So that time between four thirty and five, um, we're just going to be in here setting up. So that's a chance for you to maybe go and check out Experimedia Media if you haven't already done so. Uh, and if you're a finalist for the awards, could you be here maybe around about quarter two, just so we can run through with you how we're going to do it? And that's all I have on my little iPad thing. Um, we're very excited, um, as we are with both of our internationals, to have um, Adam Salton here. Um, someone asked me last year, in a year that saw um, you know, Arkham Asylum and a whole bunch of very high profile games, what my favourite game of last year was, and I thought about it for a moment, I said Cannibal, it was the only game that kind of stuck in my head. Sorry? Oh, I was just bringing <laughs> If Barb starts trying, that's on you. <laughs> um, Adam is a, an independent developer uh, and game designer, artist, programmer, and entrepreneur. Um, his past projects include Cave Story, The Wii, Gravity Hook, Paper Mountain, Our Country. He is the founder, co founder of Sandwich Secret Software and the director of Last Chance Media. Um, and he's currently working on iPhone and Flash games until he runs out of money, um, as I'm sure many of us are. Um, he's going to talk about play and games and video games and us. Um, so please make them feel very, very welcome. Thank you guys. I like, cannot believe that as many of you are awake, or at least pretending to be. Um, See, so yeah, I'm going to talk about this, and um, I have like 120 slides, and I think I'm probably going to be done in about 20 minutes. Um, not terribly different from Brandon, but that's how we roll, apparently. Um, so I was born in 1982, and um, we had a typewriter at home, with me down the corner there, um, trying to type, even though I can't walk, and uh, we also had a PC at home, which was a really weird um, thing uh, at about that time, and so I kind of fell in love with these things at a pretty early age. So that led to me playing Super Mario Brothers, which um, became a serious problem for me at about age six. Um, this led to me eventually finally messing around and making some kind of pixelated flash games. They started out really small and really simple, but that was okay. That was a couple years ago. But when I started doing that, I met this guy, Alec, um, at GDC 2008. Uh, and that led to me meeting uh, a bunch of other people and eventually attending uh, TIG Jam, uh, which is like a, a cool local game jam thing up in Winnipeg. Uh, this year. This is Mike who made a uh, salt skier. Um, he's eating a cupcake. Um, and while I was there, um, Lee Sand, who's one of the pair who are making this amazing documentary called Indie Game the Movie, asked me a really, what seemed like a really simple question at the time, which is why do you make games? And I had like a, an answer because so I was doing an interview, but I don't know if it was the best one. But Scott McCloud's is a super important question. I like Scott McCloud a lot, and I'll talk about him a little bit more as I go. But he says that this matters a lot. So this question led to a blog post where I considered it a little bit more and started to get more interested, interested in it. And that led to sort of uh, getting invited to come here and starting uh, a lot of research about like how do you even begin to answer this question in a competent way that makes sense. 
So that led to me in here right now. <laughs> so I think Scott McLeod is completely right in that this is a really important question to ask. Why do I make games instead of doing anything else? Uh, there's lots of other things that I enjoy. I spend basically every waking hour thinking about them. And I don't think I have the kind of answer that Scott McCloud was looking for. He read Understanding Comics, he asked this question, and he's talking about something that mature artists do when they've mastered their craft and they're trying to figure out what to do. Are they going to explore form? Or are they going to explore ideas and philosophy? And that's, I, like, I'm not even 30, I don't even know what I'm doing. So I don't really have that answer, but I have a pretty long answer, um, which hopefully will, if, if not get us somewhere interesting, at least have an interesting conversation. So if we're going to talk about games and why we make them, then we need to talk about play first. And if we're going to talk about play, we have to talk about this book uh, called Rollins, and it's maybe the most important scholarly work on the concept of play that has ever been conceived or executed by man. It's a really big deal. So it was written um, despite his uh, distinctly unplayful appearance by this guy, uh, Johan Harzinger, who's a um, prominent and well-known pre-World War II Dutch historian. Like, definitely the kind of guy you associate with video games, right? So, he wrote his essay, or didn't write it, he conceived his essay in 1933, um, at, during a series of talks, not unlike this one, at you know, various universities in Europe, and um, this led to uh, a project of his own, which was about five years, and in 1938, you know, obviously way before there were video games, uh, he published this book, Home Alone. And this is a book that people know about, like, um, Katie and Eric School's playbook has a little, like, half page about, like, Home Alone, and it's why it's sort of interesting, and then they move on. Um, and I think, it kind of misses the point. And other people have talked about it, Jesper Jules sort of like, at least somewhat obliquely refers to it on a fairly regular basis. But they're kind of, I, in, in my opinion, they're missing this, the thing about what he wrote that is so interesting. So I'm gonna talk about that first. And what I think Harzinga does for this idea of play, we're not talking about games here, just play and playing and playfulness and all those ideas, is kind of what Scott McCloud did for comics and understanding comics, which is he provides a broad, but not too broad, definition. And he provides a lot of cultural and historical context, um, which is a really cool thing when you are in a medium that is you know, fairly rightly accused of being fairly narrow and being about a lot of the same things all the time. So according to Harzing, a play is not just the opposite of serious. And play is not just something that children do. And placing play in human history is completely impossible. Like these are just sort of like weird made up ideas like that, that we've been working on for the last couple, you know, decades maybe. So the thing about play is it's beyond it what Herzinger calls the human sphere, right? Which just means that animals play. Like dogs play, cats play, obviously. Um, this is everywhere all the time. We all kind of know it. But it's the same kind of play. They play for the same reasons that we do. So, again, this is kind of obvious, but to me, it's pretty amazing. It means that play was around before us. So, like, animals were playing, and then there were humans. And this is kind of an amazing thing. So, there's a bunch of stuff about play that's really interesting. Um, and, and he has a formal definition, but first he has these sort of qualities. Uh, and one is that play is really pervasive. If an animal is capable of play, it can't not play. It'll do it all the time. And so, like for example, how many of you who are here right now are sort of listening to the talk, but are kind of like imagining a game you want to work on instead? <laughs> right? Like that's that is this force of play that is that is fueling you that is going all the time. You can't really do anything about it. So play is one of the reasons that this happens is play is what Herzogus uh, calls significant. Uh, and this doesn't well. Basically, it's value for the participants, for the people engaged in the play. Um, you know, animals play because they get something out of it, but they don't get money out of it or like achievements or you know bonus points or anything. They get these weird intangible things like joy and satisfaction. 
So if you're playing for profit, you know, uh, or for survival, then by definition it's not play. So this gets kind of tricky because lots of play obviously has a lot of tangible side effects. You know, play fighting or you know, foot racing your brother when you're younger has these like uh, cool side effects where you get better at what you're doing, or if you play a lot of Street Fighter, you get way better at Street Fighter. Um, but you're not usually if you're playing Street Fighter only to get better at Street Fighter then it's kind of more work than play. But if you're just playing Street Fighter to play Street Fighter, then, you know, it's, it's like kind of, it's almost circular, but basically, play is only play if it's done with intent to play. But it's still not even a real definition, right? So play is pervasive, we can't not do it. It's significant, we get something out of it, but the things we get are non-tangible. They're non, you know, it can't be right? piles of money. Um, so, there's a bunch of actual qualities that define play for Harzinga, and I think they're really useful in the same way that Scott McCall's definition for comics is a really useful thing. Um, the first is that it's voluntary. You can't be forced to play, no matter what your brother says. Play is something that you opt into and opt out of. Um, play happens separate from real life, and this is kind of like a weird, this sounds like a kind of hippie idea or something, but um, it has its own rules, and play is all very much about creating an alternate, kind of impossibly perfect universe, where instead of there being chaos and things you can't control, there are rules, and um, Simon Park and I think wrote an amazing essay about Japanese RPGs and how they do this in a really cool way, but again, we're not even talking about games, this is just play. This is, you know, you're not even playing a game, like you're playing a musical instrument, you're still in this kind of isolated space that has nothing to do with work or, you know, your geography. It's about creating this separate space with rules and um, the thing is, there's only an alternate universe during play. You know, the same space where you're playing a game, uh, as soon as you stop playing, it's no longer this kind of magical space where these rules apply. There are things outside of your control that can happen now. So play has a start and a stop. It's separate from reality. It's something you opt into. And this space is a really special part of it. Almost all play is in this sort of um, parsing, I really like this term, it sounds really dramatic, but parsing calls it the sacred circle. Uh, and it's the location where the play is happening. So if you're playing The Floor is Lava, you know, it's the room that you happen to be in at the time. And that's, that's where The Floor is Lava. And play has rules. And that sounds like we're talking about games already, but um, it doesn't have to be like football rules, where it's like, oh, you're offsides, and that has this penalty, and there are these clear delineations. Um, stuff like uh, Japanese tea house etiquette is all part of this like play concept of people assuming roles and having these specific ways they behave. Um, and you can always play again. Like, you can always go, oh, man, we had so much fun playing Flores Lava yesterday that we're going to do it again today in the same room, in the same place, with the same rules. And so this isn't, this isn't games, and this isn't human play. I've been using human examples, but, you know, when puppies play fight, they're obviously playing, there's a specific start and stop time. You know, they're sleeping, then they wake up, then they play fight, then they, you know, pass out or crap everywhere. And, but they have rules too, right? So there's like, the, you know, if one dog bites too hard, it's like clearly breaking the rules. You know, you don't draw blood. There are rules about where they're having their fight, if they fight on their mom, and dog flips out. Like, they have all the same structures that we do. And it's one of, these, it's, it's one of the things that I think um, other people have drawn an actual division for. Jesper Jewell kind of draws a line um, based on, like, Swedish linguistics between, like, formal games and informal games. But um, the big picture, I think, is way more interesting. So, there's a couple of things, and these aren't really definitions, they're just like interesting tangents, I think. If someone intentionally breaks the rules of play, if they, 